turn it over to Mr. Richard Smith, who's going to talk about his journey with uh, DMARC. Richard, over to you. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, feels good to finally give back a little bit to the community. Uh, office hours, Azure hours, been a uh, big part of my career here for the last few years. So um, appreciate the time um, everyone's taken here today to talk uh, through DMARC. Um, so quick background myself, I've worked in technology one area or another for around 20 years now. I've worked in higher ed at Southern Illinois for nine years. About half that time was spent in our infrastructure and cloud teams. And now I'm working as a security architect. And one of the first projects that I got handed to me after our migration to uh, the A5 suite and Defender and off of our proof point for email was looking at DMARC and implementing DMARC. So a little bit of a background here on the university, obligatory kind of slide here. Um, we are located in Carbondale, Illinois. So people think Illinois, think about Chicagoland where I grew up. Uh, we are can't just about be as far away from Chicago as we are. Um, Chicago is about half an hour, 45 minutes um, from Wisconsin. We're about the same down to Kentucky. So a uh, good five and a half hour drive to get down there. Um, Low one to one faculty student ratio, sorry, low one to one student to faculty ratio, and uh, we're a Carnegie R2 institution for research. Uh, within this, we have about 100 IT staff members. Um, also, you see our, our student headcounts 11,000. We have about 47,000 mailboxes, over 100,000 uh, user objects, and about 40,000 uh, AD groups. Uh, within this project here, we looked at probably around 100 applications to that would be sending mail on our behalf. Um, and we had sent a survey to people and about 25 people responded to that survey. And we'll get into that in a little bit here. So we have a lot to talk about, so let me just dive right into it. Before I get into the project, let's just talk about why we want to implement DMARC, right? Uh, it's a new technology, different tools, not really that new, but it's new to us. So we have to come up with reasons and um, determine why we want to actually implement it. So the biggest thing for us is to mitigate spam across the organization and really mitigate users from impersonating us. Uh, we had a couple of academic institutions reaching out to our SOC and saying, hey, you guys are spamming us you know, pretty consistently. You guys have compromised accounts or you're just you know, sometimes spoofing us, things like that. So this is one step in that direction to basically help mitigate spam for our organization there. Um, just like anything else technology, we have a lot of back and forth here, and we have some users who want, you know, the best of both worlds here, right? They want us to block all the spammers, right? Doesn't matter. They don't want a message, even though 20 other people might want it. They want us to block that, so, but they also want you to allow their applications in, right? Uh, at the same time, we can't just go block every Gmail or Yahoo address that looks potentially suspicious because that is a um, potential um, future students. So we can't just go blocking whole domains in. So we also can't allow every application in there. So again, it's kind of a catch-22 that a lot of us are going to be running into in the secure industry when working in higher ed, is you have to combat spam, but also maintain a sense of openness to allow people to collaborate and um, recruit and research as well. Contrary to popular belief, um, especially by my bank when I first bought my uh, first house, they wanted me to send all my, you know, social driver's license, et cetera, um, through email. Email was never intended to be a secure form of communication, and we'll get into that in a minute here. So we have three main project stages here. First stage is discovery. Um, there was a technology overview. I've taken a few of those slides from that deck. It was about an hour and a half presentation I gave to our networking systems and security groups. Um, so we had a little bit of discovery talking about the technology, how it's useful, um, how we're going to implement it, how we're going to maintain this and operationalize it. Um, and then we also talked about our current infrastructure, right? We had to go and look into it and figure out what we have. And then finally, determine what applications out there are allowed to send email on our behalf. Uh, once we've determined what those applications were, we reached out to the stakeholders for those applications and had them um, initiate contact with the third party vendors there in order to set up either DKIM or DMARC. And finally, we want to you know, set up DMARC in an enforcement mode, and we want to be able to operationalize that, have reporting, et cetera, and common workflows that we can then support this in a long-term situation. Um, the good thing about all this, one of the easy way for us to help sell it, especially in that outreach phase, is to explain to everyone you know, that DMARC's easy, 
from their aspect, right? We're the technology professionals. We're going to handle all the heavy lifting there. And the better thing, especially to our marketing group, is that once DMARC is implemented, the likelihood that messages that are being sent out from these marketing campaigns end up in the user's inbox goes up dramatically, even if it's not an SIU account, right? You're sending to a Gmail account, you're sending to other institutions. Uh, with a DMARC policy in place, we are looking forward to um, better delivery rates and better open rates there as a result. So walking into the technology here. So there's a lot to discuss and it's gonna be a shallow dive, right? I've spent an hour and a half on a similar talk and I'm you know, gonna try to knock this out in about 30 minutes here. So um, let's just kind of rock into it. The big thing, if you don't understand anything about email is, um, or in DMARC, is to have a solid understanding of DNS. It's the base technology that's gonna be used for all this. If you don't understand a little bit about mail headers and DNS, I have um, some links in this slide deck here, and we'll talk through some things to kind of help you figure it out. First, just talking pure email, trying to level set everyone here. Um, when you open up your Outlook client and you see that the message is coming from someone, I'll just say your chancellor, so chancellor at SIU.edu, whenever you're looking at that from address, that is what we call a P2 header. It is the from address here on the left-hand side. This is the only address that people actually see in their Outlook client. This is where your safe senders list, block lists, et cetera, kind of comes from. Um, unfortunately, this is not where a lot of the email technology like DKIM and SPF are set up. That is set up over here on the P1 or the envelope side. And this is the mail server for lack of a better word in terms of trying to keep it pretty easy here. Um, it is the servers that are sending that message and where a bounce back is going to um, come back to. So let's take a look at a header real quick. Hopefully you've looked at headers before. If not, um, welcome to the fun here. All a header it does is it's give you a little bit of a background and um, more or less a, a travel history of, an, of a message from the time that it leaves a person's inbox. Um, I'm sorry, for the time it leaves a person's um, Outlook client and ends up in the inbox of the recipient there. Within this, we want to, again, determine which one are the P1 and P2 headers. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in here for a second just so you can get a little better idea here. Um, so in our case, from the last slide, the from address is our P2 header. Sorry, one second there. There we go. This is zoomed in the wrong slide. The from address here is the P2 header. This is the SIUC news at SIU.edu. And the return path or the server infrastructure that sent it is the P1. And this, you can see, has nothing to do with SAU, blackbodyemail.netcommunity1.com. This happens to be a valid third party that we want to send on behalf of SIU. And that's going to be important throughout the remainder of the discussion. So in order to make things easier here, I'm going to refer to SIU to EDU as our organizational email. And I'm going to kind of pick on netcommunity1 here and um, use them as an example for most of the um, discussion here. Uh, when you're looking at and trying to check out um, SPF, DMARC, and DKIM. Um, again, it's all based on SPF. I'm, I'm sorry, it's all based on DNS. And DNS is pretty easy to check um, with command line. You can open a PowerShell or Bash. I put some of the commandlets and um, one-liners here for this. Um, the biggest thing I can stress to everyone is to have a good understanding of SPF and DKIM. We're going to walk into it at a very um, shallow level today. Um, but those two, one or both of those, are the underlying factors to in order to making DMARC work. So let's dive right into SPF. SPF, it's root form. You can just think of it as a list of IP addresses that are allowed to send email. So it is a particular server, in this case at NetCommunity1, they have a list of IP addresses that they're saying all these IP addresses are allowed to send email as our domain and pass SPF. Again, told you it's all about DNS. Here's a DNS entry here in the upper right hand corner is our DNS for SIU.edu. There is only one SPF record per domain. So SIU.edu, you can just resolve that, look at the text entries here, and you're gonna look for one that starts with the V equals SPF one. The rest of these here are just um, verification or other types of um, text records in the domain. Most of them can actually be deleted, but that's a different story. Um, so you're gonna look for the one that says V equals SPF one. And within that, um, you're going to find multiple factors. So 
I'll look at the bottom of the screen here in the middle. Each message, or I'm sorry, each um, space in between each area is a quali um, is a mechanism. So every mechanism is precedated by a qualifier, and that's either plus a question mark, a tilde, or a minus sign. And order basically means if you plus, you are allowing anything within this IP address range. So in this case, this is a plus IP4. So we're allowing anything with the 131.230 slash 16 to be allowed to send email as our domain. Um, if it has a question mark, um, it is unknown. If it has a tilde, it is a soft fail and a negative uh, minus sign there is a hard fail for SPF, meaning that you do not want that to be included at all. Um, you can also use an include mechanism. Again, I'm not going to dive into this too deep. And include, you can think of it as a way of chaining multiple SPF records together. And at the end of the day, SPF is doing one um, final look and is saying every single um, res resolution of this DNS here will come back with a list of IP addresses. And those IP addresses are the sum of any messages that can be sent or any servers that can send email on behalf of that. Um, domain there. Here's a little bit of a workflow on how SPF works. You sender will send a message. It'll go out of their organization's mail server. It'll go through a bunch of different transport agents before it finally ends up in the recipient's email server in the mailbox. I'm sorry, within their recipient's email server. That server, if it supports SPF, the majority of them do now, will do a DNS check back to the sending organization's DNS server. Again, the sending organization is a little bit misleading here. This is actually the organization in our case, the Net Community One, that is sending that message. If it returns an IP address that is valid, that is on that list, it is going to pass that. If it doesn't, it is going to potentially reject it or just mark it as a rejected message. Just because it's rejected doesn't mean necessarily it's going to end up in the trash or get bounced back, um, but it can in the majority of cases. So it's a little bit misleading here. You could almost just draw a little arrow here and say, yeah, rejected messages still may at some point in time end up back at the inbox, even if it is an SPF fail. So some pros and cons here. Um, pros is it's validating all the IP addresses of the sending mail infrastructure. Again, the server domain that's sending the message, it's gonna decrease spoofing whenever um, SPF is enforced. Unfortunately, it doesn't survive message forwarding. So that's, um, a little bit of a problem there. Um, and it also, there can be some difficulty in maintaining SPF records. Um, if you notice a couple slides ago, there's also a check of 10 DNS lookups for each SPF record. Um, we didn't get into that too much, but um, it can be a little bit overbearing to keep up with. And there's also can be a lot of IPs. My organization alone has 335,000 IP addresses that are allowed to send it as of earlier this year. So after SPF, another technology for authentication is DKIM. This is allowing a message to basically be um, ensure that it hasn't been altered in transit. So this is done through public and private key pairs, pretty much just like websites, SSL that goes through that. Um, sports and messages, DKIM is not encryption. Even though we're gonna talk about public and private keys, we are not encrypting messages in this case. We're only validating that a message has not been modified in its transit from the time it left the, uh, the individual set send and someone received it in their inbox there. I'm going to walk through the workflow here. Looks slightly different. Um, in the upper um, side again, you have our mail server that is sending messages. And in this case, this mail server has a private key, just like an SSL private key. It is going to sign this email message. It's going to take a portion of it. It's going to take the subject line, the from and the to, the timestamp, even a portion of the body of the message, it's going to take all that data and it's going to sign that and include in the headers what pieces of information and what order it took. And it's going to go ahead and just send that across. When the receiving server picks it up, it's going to look at that DKIM signature. And as long as it supports DKIM, it's going to look for two key entries in this. It's going to look for something with the D equals. This is the domain that it's looking for, in this case, example.com. And the S here stands for selector. And we're going to get into that in a minute. So it matches up domain and a selector here. It's going to look at the public DNS record for this um, domain here. So again, not the sender, not the sending infrastructure, but whatever is signed here is the D. And it's going to look at that and it's going to validate that. If that message is passed, it's going or hasn't been changed, and the keys um, 
match, then it is going to be a decan pass. If not, it is going to fail. Looking at the re DNS records here, again, this time instead of looking at just SIU.edu, we're going to look at alumni.SIU.edu. Every DKIM record is uh, prefaced with an underscore domain key, and before that is what I mentioned earlier, it's a selector. So unlike SPF, where it only has one SPF record per domain, in this case, we're looking at alumni.SIU.edu, um, you're going to have multiple selectors for each domain um, because you're going to be one per application or signatory type. Um, so the format is always going to be a selector dot underscore domain key dot your domain dot the top level domain here. So example below, mail marketing default NYC dot staffers and SFO dot letters. These are all different selectors that each have their own individual public key. It's in the P equals for each DKIM record. Again, sorry, we're going through this pretty quick here. If you have any questions, we can address them here at the end of the call. Um, but just kind of want to walk through a little bit of this. Uh, pros and cons. Good thing is that it is going to again verify that the sender is authorized. It's going to authorize that through the fact that it is signing and not altering the message. So you know that the domain that it's actually picked up from has to be um, valid because otherwise it wouldn't have a public key to actually check against. Um, it's going to decrease the likelihood of spoofing, increase domain reputation, and it normally survives meshes forwarding. Um, cons it's subject to interpret interception, so you can't actually have a, a key get compromised, um, but rotating keys can make um, check of that. And finally, it's also not a valid source because just like SPF, DKIM doesn't care who's sending the message. It doesn't care that you're spoofing your chancellor. It doesn't care that you're spoofing your president or you know, the CIO of your own organization. It's only looking at the server infrastructure, how messages are signed, and as a bad actor, Bad actors also have infrastructure, right? You know, they're not just operating off of compromised machines. Sometimes they are, but they also have their own infrastructure. They're running their own mail servers and things like that. They can go ahead and DKIM sign a message, send it over to you, and, and if all you're doing is saying, does, it, does there a DKIM equals pass here and not caring about the domain, you can still allow a message through like that. And finally, let's get now to what we're talking about here today, which is DMARC. Again, a very long-winded name. I won't read it up here. You can read it for yourself here. And the RFC document literally is stating here that it's protecting the domain name of the from field, in this case, the actual from address that you see in Outlook against spoofing. And this is what we're looking for here. So again, just want to reiterate here that we care about SPF and DCAM. This is the cornerstone of making DMARC work. So you can look through this slide at your leisure later on, um, but this is just showing you a couple different examples of message headers and how things like Microsoft here report back an SPF pass. You're going to look for a line called authentication dash results. Here's the workflow. It gets a little bit more complicated for DMARC. Um, again, just looking at some messages that are being sent. Um, it's going to do a check against SPF and or DKIM, and it's going to determine if there's something called alignment. And this alignment is, for lack of better words, is matching up either the D equals and the and the DKIM entry, the domain of the of that DKIM entry, or the um, P1 header, the sending infrastructure um, domain, if that passes SPF. If either one of those things are true. DMARC um, and they match with the from address, DMARC is going to go ahead and pass and send that message through. If it doesn't, it's going to um, hopefully reject it whenever we get set up here. Um, the other good thing and the second section here and the R within the DMARC stands for reporting. It has a good reporting capabilities. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. Um, so every server that's received a message that supports DMARC, most servers, I shouldn't say everyone, most servers will actually log every single message that's sent with a person that supports DMARC, it is going to aggregate every single message and it's going to tell you in a daily report, or it can be configured to be shorter than that, but by default, a daily report is going to come back to you and say, hey, you have this, these messages coming from these IPs, coming to be from your domain, and this is what's passing D, um, DMARC, this is what's failing DMARC, and this is what's passing in, um, and um, failing SPF and DKIM as well and it's going to send those. It can also send a forensic report, which is basically a um, bounce back report in a MAR format. We'll get into that here. So aggregate reports, a little bit cumbersome. Um, they're XML based. They are sent, again, by default every day, 
and it's one report per receiver or per you know main organization or infrastructure here and it's thousands of rows right so you're going to need some way of parsing that message um, and you know extracting that report parsing it and sending it to some type of a tool here uh, a forensic report is basically just think of another um, bounce back it's going to send every single individual message back to you and it depends on how many um, failures you have you can have a lot of messages being sent so you have one email message being sent on the left and you have multiple messages being sent on the right want to be remiss without talking a little bit about the DNS entry. Uh, it's pretty easy if you get familiar with the other ones, a lot like SPF, there's only a single uh, DMARC entry per domain or subdomain, and it starts with an underscore DMARC. So underscore DMARC, if you were looking for a text entry for V equals DMARC one, and it's going to have all of these um, selectors afterwards. Um, again, V just like SPF and DKIM is talking about the version number. Um, P is the most important thing here, the second most, and this is your policy. By default, you start with P equals none. And that's really why I wanted to have this discussion here today with everyone is because it's kind of like, you know, when you start looking at something, you just constantly keep on looking for it, looking for it. Um, so I spent a little bit of time on this project and I, I see the vast majority of every .edu um, organization either doesn't have DMARC or they have DMARC and P equals none. It's very rare for me to see that many organizations with anything other than P equals none. So the P um, would either be none, which is just auditing. You can turn that on today without impacting anything, or else it's gonna quarantine or reject it. If you quarantine it, it is going to send it to the spam folder or do whatever a quarantine would be within your mail infrastructure. And a reject is an outright um, um, deny, reject that message there. The last important thing here are these two fields on the right here, the RUA and the RUF. This is the aggregate and the forensic report. And you set these to basically be an email address. It's an email box that is going to accept those reports or accept those forwarded messages or attached messages. Um, and this is how you're gonna get all of your data for reporting. Again, this is very critical. Get out of P equals none as quick as you can, but you know, we can go ahead and, you know, at least make one step today in terms of getting there. So I mentioned earlier, SPF has 10 lookups. DMARC only does two. The first thing it looks at is it looks for the sender address. Again, this is the from address that you see in your Outlook. It's gonna look at this domain, example.com. And it's gonna say, example.com, do you have a DMARC record at DMARC, underscore DMARC.example.com? If it does, cool, it's done. Same thing if you have subdomains, xyz.example.com, it's going to look at underscore demarked at xyz.example.com. Same thing if you have you know, a second subdomain here. The second check it does is if it can't find a DMARC record there, it says, okay, let's look at the organizational domain. The organizational domain, for lack of better words for most people, is the you know, what you consider here, one level above the top level domain. It actually is um, the public suffix list, which is a little bit more complicated than that. Um, think about something, um, J JP, Japan has a lot of public suffixes. Um, .gov is actually a, um, is not only a, a .gov, dot, every state has one. So IL.gov for Illinois, every you know two digit um, abbreviation for a state dot, gov is all in itself a public suffix so it's going to look at one level above that and it is going to look for there so in this case example.com it doesn't need to do a second check right because example.com is the organizational domain but these other two here you can see both if there's one subdomain or multiples it's always going to go back to this root so one level above your your um, public suffix so it's going to only look at this um, root um, domain here for your uh, DMARC. Now, take a br break here before I go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, we, there is a little game, I'm not gonna play it here because uh, it's gonna take up a little bit too much time. But at this point, I would usually kind of go through a table and say, okay, if, if SPF passes and DKIM passes, you know, if it's aligned in this particular way, you know, what is DMARC gonna do, right? It's important to go through that. I'm going to show you instead um, a pretty involved slide. Don't be scared. Um, I am not gonna go through this slide. It has way too much information. This is direct courtesy from Microsoft here. Um, the link is in the, um, the description. 
Um, but the biggest thing I want to point out to you in this is alignment, right? So alignment, again, at a very base level is saying, if I am sending a message and I'm claiming to be chancellor at siu.edu, I'm looking at siu.edu, does siu.edu, is that message passing, is, is that message the same as what's in um, the SPF record? If they are not the same, alignment's gonna fail and DMARC will always fail. Same thing with, D, with DKIM. It is going to look at siu.edu in the chancellor you know, email just that you're pretending to send from, and it's going to look, does your DKIM record say D equals siu.edu or a subdomain that would then go back to the organization? If that doesn't pass, it's an automatic DMARC fail. If both of those pass, or either one of these pass, I should say, SPF or DKIM, then DMARC will pass. At SIU, and just because of our nature of higher education and having so many applications that we have to deal with, um, in my opinion, it's not really conducive to enforce SPF. Your SPF records just get way too crazy, way too big. So in our project, we went primarily with DKIM as the authentication. Not saying we completely shoved SPF out the, out the door, because um, there is some very important areas and it does help protect things. Um, but the likelihood of our, you know, of rotation being an issue within our DKIM entries, we feel a little bit more safe with that. And again, supporting so many applications, I can get into that in a few minutes if you um, have some questions about it, but that's the route that we took for this. So what's it look like when we're all said and done? You're gonna look at authentication results again. This is a um, header message. You're gonna see SPF passes. So the sender IP here, blackbodyemail.netcommunity1.com, right? Um, then our DKIM passes because the header was verified as siu.edu. So DMARC is passing in this case. DMARC in this case is only passing because of DKIM. SPF would not pass DMARC. So if we didn't have a DKIM record here, this message would not pass because the SPF pass, you notice that the mail from is this netcommunity1.com. Again, not picking on them. They're one of our first setups for, for DKIM um, and it's used a lot for our marketing group. Um, it's a good organization, but um, in this particular message, if they didn't have DKIM set up, it would not work. Um, the only way around it, you delegate domains, things like that. We'll get into in a minute. Um, so pros and cons, again, resist spoofing while making use of existing authentication, SPF and, and DKIM. Um, some problems here, it doesn't always survive forwarding, usually it does, but, and also listservs. Listservs can be a real pain in the rump. So if you have your own domain, segmented just for your listservs, then you're probably okay. You can just put a different DMARC record on that and um, do what you want with it. Um, that should get by you with most of it. Um, but the bigger problem for us has been third-party um, listservs. So a different or education organization that might have a listserv and it's wanting our users to send on behalf of their email address. Well, we have nothing to do with their infrastructure and that's been more problematic for us than anything else. Um, and then it also doesn't, you know, address things that you're just typically not going to have problems, right? It doesn't address cousin domains, lookalike domains, display name attacks, et cetera, right? Compromised accounts at the end of the day, they're still compromised, right? So if I compromise, if one of my users gets compromised in my organization, DMARC does nothing for me, right? If it, not anything else, it helps the bad actor actually get into the inbox because they're sending a message, you know, that's going to pass DMARC. So uh, it's a little bit of a catch-22 there, but um, pros definitely outweigh the cons in this area. Promised you a few more tools here. So again, here's a couple of websites. I'll have this again in the slide deck or post it later in chat. Um, emailstuff.org. It's just a really useful site, especially if you're not used to looking at um, looking at command line to figure out um, if things pass. This is also really nice for taking an SPF record and saying, how many IP addresses do I actually have an SPF? Toss it into here, and it's going to kick you back a bunch of sliders that you can then go ahead and, and um, pick up. Uh, message header analyzer from Microsoft's uh, really nice. If you don't understand headers or don't want to kind of wade through that, you can just copy and paste the full headers into the analyzer. It gets it broken down in a nice table. It's pretty easy. Um, MX Toolbox, hope everyone's used that. It's a really nice, um, useful tool. And finally, if uh, you have um, Linux and use Nmap at all, there's a silent uh, query here, so I can actually pull that off. Um, one pretty um, neat trick here is if you're using Windows Subsystem for Linux um, and having your MNAP set up over there, if you go ahead and just pipe this to the clipboard, and this is why I like to type instead of 
writing because yeah, you can't even read that. Never mind. Um, pipe it to a clip. That'll actually pipe the output of this to the clipboard. It's pretty useful if you're wanting to look up a lot of messages there. All right. Last section here. I want to get into the project and how we went through this here. So first step, again, before you can write a song, you have to have a single note on your piece of paper, right? So you want to get this done, right? I mean, if you're watching us a recording now, pause it now. Go back, look it up, get your DMARC records stood up, and set it up with P equals none. Please set it up as P equals none when you first start off. If you don't do that, you're going to have a bad day. You're going to break all kinds of email. Don't get me or yourself into trouble. Set it up with P equals none. Again, walking through the project here, we're going to dive through each phase now. Phase one, discovery. Um, First thing again, technology overview, training up your teams. This slide deck or a very longer winded version of it, um, I gave to some of my teams here, kind of talk through um, all the technology, create your DMARC policy and start getting that reporting, right? Start getting that data. Even if your project is gonna be three to six months down the road, having that data does you no, no bad. It's only gonna basically give you that data that you can then use later on. Again, we had used Proofpoint for years. We had started going through a proof of concept for um, Proofpoint to handle our DMARC. Um, again, we had a, they were a great company. They were good partners to us. Unfortunately, just funding didn't work out for us to keep them. Um, and obviously funding didn't work it out for their DMARC um, solution as an, as an added cost there. Um, either way, get your reports going on. When you first get your reports, um, you're going to send it somewhere, right? You have to take those XMLs and parse them and send them to, to a visualization tool. Um, in our case, we did it through Splunk. Um, there's also a service called Valamail I'm going to talk about here in a second, and it's actually really useful if you're first starting out. So here's just an example screenshot of when we first started looking at it. This is a, again, very bare bones, basic Splunk dashboard. I love Splunk, but I'm not any by any means a master editor. Um, even good at it, really, I'd say. So, um, you know, if you have that tool in house, go ahead and deal with it. But our biggest issue um, is just looking down at everything that comes in here, right? We're doing some reverse DNS lookups, but we're not really getting into and saying what application is using this. So it gets a little bit unbearing in terms of the amount of IP addresses and things that you're going to look at in here. And it, it makes a lot of that work on your own, but it's still very useful. As you can tell, this is very early on when I took the screenshot, probably back in February. Um, this, this solid blue is all failures, so we have very little passes in our DMARC at that particular time. Um, Valamail, I'm not gonna try to make this a sales call. Um, not gonna hold anyone's water here either, um, but Valamail is a really um, neat um, set up here. They have a free monitoring system. So remember I told you earlier for the DMARC uh, message, you need to send that to an email address. You point it to Valamail's ingestion engine and they do all of the reporting for you. So here's an example of our mail here um, from last month. Um, and as you can see now, we went up from that really bad chart to we're at 97% DMARC passing. And every month, I look through the services that are failing and I say, okay, who's failing now? Is this, you know, does this look legitimate? Does it look like it's illegitimate? If it is legitimate, um, I do my best to figure out who the um, application owner is. So other parts of phase one is looking at your current implementation. So <laughs> there's a lot of words here. Um, I took this as an opportunity to clean up a lot of stuff. Um, I am, I am, I, get aggravated when my active directory is not clean it's still not clean i get aggravated when a lot of things aren't clean so um i was looking through our mail setup and figured out how everything was going here so you at the bare minimum you need to figure out how your email is being routed right we were pretty easy we had just got off a of proof point all of our routing became a lot nicer and simpler all through 0365 so that part's pretty easy yours might be a little bit more difficult um do you have any spf dcam dmark stuff going on in order to figure this out um one of our network engineers, um, I had him grep um, the entire bind um, configs and pull me every record of SPF, Kim and DMARC, and he made a really nice script to do it and got it back to me um, pretty quickly. And we looked at it um, and then determined if it's needed or not. My organization, we started off with 65 domains in Office 365, 72 domains in our Active Directory, and we ended up with about 40 domains. So not half, but we cut off a good number. And out of those 40, um, which is including the default Microsoft uh, on Microsoft one. Um, a few of those can also be removed and some of them we even set up to only be receiving. So we actually are for, um, not allowing mail to be sent from those subdomains because they're 
really legacy stuff. Um, we were largely decentralized. I didn't mention that earlier. Um, some years back, so um, we're getting closer to being centralized, but there's still a good amount of campus units that aren't, and there's a lot of legacy stuff out there. Um, and then finally, the biggest part down here, identifying all your third-party mail senders, right? Um, some of this is pretty easy, right? You look at your heavy hitters. You have Office 365, Desire to Learn, or whatever your LMS is, Listserv. You might have a mass mail and MTA agent of some type. Those are some pretty easy wins. Uh, application team can give you other ones. For our cases, we had Higher Touch, SSC Campus, Blackbaud, um, et cetera. Our mar your marketing groups are probably a good one to reach out to. But ultimately, I just made a Microsoft form. I reached out to all of our campus groups. We have a unit called the Technology Partners that are all of our non-centralized and centralized people together. I, I presented over there a very brief discussion of saying, hey, give me your third-party mailers. We need to do this project. If you don't do it, mail's not gonna come through. If you do it, then your mail is likely to end up in the inbox a lot nicer. So it was a win-win, made it pretty easily. Um, and um, finally, you're gonna look at your DMARC reports, but we'll save that to the end here. Here's an example of what my form looked like. Very simple, not too flashy, right? I just said, hey, give me some information, give me a contact, let's open that dialogue here, right? Um, don't wait until you have 50 or 100 responses. You know, you get a few responses, just start working on it. You wanna start reaching out, implementing DKIM as much as you can, and um, wait for the rest of them to kind of come through. Uh, here's a little quick example of what our uh, workflow looked like, again, you, this is assuming that you know an application there. Um, so you know that there's an application out there in the wild somewhere. They either they report it to you or you found it, and you're going to have a contact at your organization, right? And you're going to determine, do you need DKIM or not? And that's really pretty easy. Hey, are you sending mail as your organization, as SAO to EDU? If you're not, if you're just sending a no reply at you know Microsoft.com, you don't need DMARC because it's not going to matter because you have to. It only cares about your organization domain. So again, you're gonna look through that. If you determine that you do need DMARC, you're gonna have that user reach out to the third party, right? In this case, most of the time, we're opening up support cases with the vendor and saying, hey, we wanna set up DMARC. Um, I'm gonna put my one-liner in here. Kid you not, this saved so much headache. I would open up a conversation with you know, anyone, our, a person in our registrar's unit, a office worker in admissions, it doesn't matter. Um, I said, let's work through it. I'm going to do all the heavy lifting. All I need you to do is open up a ticket that says this. SIU you would like to discuss and set up a DKIM. You know, I gave them this little sh one sentence. They'd open up a ticket. I said, don't worry about it. There's going to be a lot of technical jargon back and forth. And eventually, you're just you're going to get a message from me that says, hey, let's test this now. I'm going to tell you it works. It's not going to look any different to you. It's just going to work. And you're going to ultimately have a lot better delivery rates on your marketing messages. And it was really pretty easily. And then obviously the biggest area that you kind of spend your time in here is doing status and updates. Um, I should have mentioned the amount of people we use for this project. Um, it was, you know, one or three, however you want to look at it, me, myself, and I, um, largely. Uh, we had a project manager that did some work on it too. Um, you know, obviously there was a lot of help from my networking group and stuff like that, but you want to have that single point of contact. In this case, you know, it was me, someone in your security unit or um, system unit, somewhere that would make sense there. Um, and I would typically run a few applications in all these phases. So I would, I would have five, 10, maybe even a couple of times, 15 or so, third-party vendor support tickets open with various vendors all in different stages of DKIM, right? They're either telling me what they support or what they don't support. They're giving me their DKIM um, public key so I can publish it to DNS. I'm waiting on my network team to publish DNS, um, or I'm kicking it back to them and saying, hey, we're good. Can you flip your bits on your end and actually start signing messages and let me take a look at them, right? So things are in multiple stages, um, and you just kind of have to keep all those plates spinning. And again, this wasn't my only project. Um, if you looked at um, what Steve sent in the intro for this, um, you know, this was one of many projects that I was handling. I was just off the cusp of a large migration off of our mail platforms and stuff. I was still cleaning that up and things. So um, it's not as insurmountable as one of my um, colleagues likes to say. Um, it is pretty attainable. You just have to, you know, again, spend some time on it. Um, some hints and tricks. Again, Make it easy on the customer or the contact. That one sentence is really all they need and ensure to them that you're gonna do the heavy lifting, right? You don't have to worry. All you need to do, have, have them open up the conversation and you're gonna work on it. 
Um, don't use default keys for DKIM. Um, a lot of times you're gonna come back in that support case and they're gonna say, okay, here you go. Here's K1 .SA, uh, K1 underscore DMARC .SA, you wanna, Well, everyone wants to use K1, right? Don't do it. Try to make it something unique, you know, a couple letters, whatever it would be. Um, go back to the vendor and, and even tell them in your initial communication, hey, I want you to have a unique key. I don't want just a K1 dot, you know, key. Um, you're gonna have either, a lot of people wanna use that same, or you're going to run into, not to pick on Microsoft too much, we're going to run into a big one organization like Microsoft who says, you don't have a choice, guys. If you want to have DKIM records signed by Microsoft, selector one dot, um, dot your domain. That's your choice. Either do it or don't. Um, maybe you have an account team that can do some backend magic or whatever. I didn't even go down that route. I advise you just to, you know, make it unique. Um, Keep a record of all the entries made. We'll talk about that here more in a second for phase three. Um, for DKIM, um, DKIM has a hard character limit of 255 characters. Um, hopefully your dentist people know how to split that into multiple text strings for, you know, some people call it long fields, things like that. Um, if you have any questions, you know, it's online. I might have a, 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 a link in here. If not, message me and I can, you know, get you, um, your team in the, involved with the right people there. Uh, next, own the process, right? You want to verify everything. I was verifying the DNS records that, that the vendor sent me that matched up. I was verifying the records that my networking team was giving back to me. I was doing that before I would send a message to the other side and saying, hey, you know, I'm confident that this is going good now, right? I've seen it, it's routing to public DNS, right? I can see public DNS, so the third party should be able to see it. Um, earlier on this call, before we started recording, someone was talking about Threat Explorer. Um, yes. Highly useful. I highly recommend using that all the time. We use it, um, my team uses it all the time for um, threats. Um, and in this case, uh, we use it for a little bit of different tricks. Um, and I'll kind of walk through a few of those now. Uh, first trick is, if you notice down here, you can do a whole bunch of advanced searches. One of these advanced searches is the sender IP. Well, remember DMARC is full of a lot of IP addresses. And you're like, what the heck is this message, right? All I got is, is you know, Facebook telling me that they got 42 messages from this random IP address that failed. What is that random IP address? Well, if you can assume that they're sending messages to your organization as well, do a search, do a Threat Explorer search for that IP address and say, hey, is this, is there messages coming in at all to my organization? And hey, yeah, it is, it's passing or failing. You're gonna see that same failure there as the other person will on Facebook, right? Um, one limitation, not too big of a deal. It's limited to 1,024 care, um, 1,024 entries. That seems like a lot, but when you start dealing with, you know, massive site ranges, it's really not. Um, one quick thing to do is up here where it says save query, um, save your query. So do a bunch of bulk messages of 1,024, um, and then, you know, continually run those, you know, as a saved query search, you don't have to go and continually copy and paste all those and keep it, you know, tracked separately. It's really nice. It saved me so much time to kind of deal with it there. Next, you want to view headers. Um, guess what? Sometimes the testing people do not send you the test message. They send it to your constituent person, right? So right within Threat Explorer, um, hopefully you all know how to use this and have used it before. If not, highly recommend it. Um, here's the authentication results right here. You can view messages on anything that you have. Again, pretty easy tool. And finally, you can find all the messages that are being blocked. You get a user who says, hey, all my messages from X platform are being blocked and they don't give you other information, right? They're not giving you IP addresses, what the what the thing is. At best, you might get a, a subject line or something. Well, here you go. You can use Start Explorer and say, hey, let me find all the messages. Here in my case, I'm using my email address. Find all the messages for me that were delivered to my junk folder, right? Here's telling me a, a bar graph. If I scroll down, I'm not going to. Um, in the screenshot, uh, we'll show you all the messages that are failing here. So again, be pretty proactive there and look that up. Remember, you can only look 30 days back, but that shouldn't be a big deal. Two more slides and I'm out here, Steve. Um, phase three, enforcement oper oper operationalizing. <laughs> um, first thing you wanna do is set a date and try to stick to it. Um, but at the very least, you need that date in there to give your team a sense of urgency. It's gonna be hard to complete if you don't do that. And by implementing the project, I don't just mean setting a date to get DMARC implemented. I mean, again, that should have been, you should have already paused this video. You should have went back. We should have done that already. I'm saying set a date to do P equals quarantine and try to commit to it. 
and you need to make uh, documentation part of the project. I recommend it for any project. Make sure documentation is part of it. And again, I'm looking at monthly reviews. You can see in the background here, I have a, a Microsoft list here that I actually sent that I store all the data for all of our DKIM and SPF entries in there, all of our delegated domains. And I, you know, use that again, not monthly, but I use it pretty often. I do a monthly check again on the Valid Mail or the Splunk um, logs here. And last thing, this is what the previous slide and the background image that you saw. Here's just some of the data I'm collecting on that list. Again, not too terribly much, um, but I'm going to collect an app name, the description. Um, I have a list of departments in here, and I have a contact person for um, our organization and a contact for the vendor. Um, in some cases, you're going to delegate a domain. Um, that's highly useful, especially if you want it to pass SPF. And I'm going to say, what domain are we delegating and what, what are we pointing that to? And again, up here is DKIM selectors. I actually have three of them. I don't, I cut it off. So um, for sake of the screenshot, um, but you can have, I won't see more people have more than three uh, DKIM records. If you want to go up to five, I don't think you'd ever get over three. Five is probably the top of it. Um, but again, set up something like this, keep track of all your data, uh, make it easy. Ultimately, future state, we want to get this list automated. I like to do some DNS checks automatically in the background that would then kick me off an alert that, you know, if a uh, DKIM entry hits X, you know, X age, you know, to stay allowed, it would alert me to that. So, a lot. Hopefully, we have a couple of minutes. I'm sorry for that. Anyone That's have okay. any questions? <laughs> there, there, were, there was a, a few um questions and they seem to be the same but there was just uh how do you get around the 10 uh dns limit or sorry uh, 10 lookup limit for spf rather uh, and, you can't <laughs> well the, the the answer was use child domains uh yeah or or yeah the other um valmail has a and that other link there and there's other vendors too um you can set up um you can take a uh, a, a, a area that you're pointing to and include a bunch of IP4s. So it's not doing a DNS records. You're just chaining all of your, your entries together. Um, you still have the same ton of them, but you have to have a very flexible DNS system to do it. Um, if you're, if you're a very static DNS shop, it's going to be a real pain in the butt. But um, if you have a nice way of doing it, you could script it out and um, pull all those IP4s in there that way, or use the service, you know, that handles all the SPF for you. There was one other question, but Sam Buckhalter answered it. Um, Mac Edwards said, we are using a mail flow to enforce DMARC with M365. Does anyone know if they are honoring P equals options yet? And he put the answer to oh, setting it up. Cool. And I don't see anything else inside the chat. If anybody has any questions, please do come off of uh, mute and ask your questions while we have uh, Richard on the line here. Uh, who's your DNS service? We're self-hosted. It's, it's self bind. Yeah, bind DNS. Um, again, another reason why we don't, you know, ours is very rigid. Well, my network team would love to have time to actually sit down and, and change it, um, but they don't. Yeah, we're using bind two and we're looking to move it to the Azure DNS service. Um, and it's still kind of scoping that out. Haven't looked at that enough to say whether or not I can do some of the other things in terms of being dynamic uh, for SPF, but um, either way, just having a good relationship with that, with whatever team is managing your, your DNS. Um, I put in probably 120 or so DNS, you know, tickets into our, you know, ITSM tool um, to our networking team to make various um, changes in DNS. Um, and they were pretty responsive, you know, after, again, big part of the early on, talk to that department, get them on board, make them understand what you're doing and how we're going to, you know, best solve it. Without them, I, this project would have lasted a lot longer than six months. And do you, um, is your DNS being hosted in like AWS or Azure or somewhere? No. It's all. It's on premise. It, I mean, it, it's all on prem. We, we do have um, a couple of bind boxes up in Azure. Um, okay. So. You know, whenever on prem is down, you know, it's still re relaying DNS, but, um, and they're all, they're all masters, but, um, but the primary mechanism is the on prem ones. Yeah, ours replicates to our um, service provider currently through their bind uh, systems as well. Yeah, I mean, ours are all, yeah, we have 
Linux VMs and and physical boxes, mostly physical boxes here in VMs in Azure um, that are running all that for our organization. So. Cool, amazing presentation. This is something that I know a lot of people are really not looking forward to tackling. <laughs> it's really not. I, I mean, I again, I can make this deck really, really complex and really crazy. And I was hopefully I didn't do too much of that here. I know I ramble on, um, but it's really not that bad. It, it, yeah. It's really not. Um, hopefully all the links I have inside this deck and stuff will get people on, on board and stuff like that. Um, reach out, I can have another call at some point or, you know, side chat with, you know, some deeper dives, but it's really not bad. It's, it's just DNS. It's the hardest thing is getting your applications lined up. And again, if you use like a form and just get people out there to start getting back into you and then just iterating through that form. And then also whenever you're talking to someone, you know, opening up that collaboration and saying, Hey, you know, what else are you sending email as, right? Do you know of anything else you're using? And um, I got a few that way too. So it's really not that bad as complex as it is. Um, there all right. We're using the SUA and the SUR records to point to mailbox or MX toolbox to uh, kind of document that for us. So Richard, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, if anybody else in the community has an idea um, on something they'd like to present on, co-present on, um, please, you know, hit me up um, next or the next session, which would have been in two weeks, is going to be canceled due to the holidays. I do want to mention one thing that I put a link in the window. I'll put it in the Teams chat as well on the question around Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Plan 1. While it's hit GA, people are buying it from standalone can get it today. It'll roll out into everybody's tenants that have A3 uh, next year. Um, so start looking for that in around January time frame. Again, Richard, awesome job. Thank you very much. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn off the recording. Thanks for having me.